Happy Easter, beloved. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Praise God for that. Uh, J.R. Tolkien wrote the masterpiece, at least in my opinion, the, the Lord of the Rings. And in this trilogy, there are often some songs that are sung and poems that are given. Um, one of these is called a walking song, but it's, it's titled The Road Goes Ever On. And so Bilbo, if you're not familiar, he's a hobbit. If you don't know what a hobbit is, imagine me just a little bit shorter. I'm still with massive feet and hairy feet, and that's a hobbit. Um, so uh, this, this hobbit is getting older, but there comes a point when he leaves the Shire, which is like a very peaceful place where the hobbits live, and they, they like to have a very kind of quiet life and so forth. But he's leaving, going kind of on an adventure, and he sings this song. He says, the road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whither then? I cannot say. And we can still relate with that idea, right? That there's a road. And so when we envision the road and, and we're always thinking like, the next thing, like when I get around that turn, what's gonna be there? When I come over the crest of that hill, what's gonna be there? And we're just always this forward-looking habit in our lives of the next thing, the next place, the next person, just whatever is next, we're always trying to look forward with hope. In fact, Douglas Gruthis, a Christian apologist, he says, humans are inescapably creatures of hope. And so when you lose hope, you actually start to lose life. You can go visit people dying in a hospital and watch the physiological effect of when they just give up hope. And so this song he sings as he sets out on adventure, going down a road saying like, where will it lead? So many opportunities, and I just, I'm eager to go. And so we can resonate so much with that. But then there comes a point later in his life, after much grand adventure, and he comes back. He's an old hobbit at this point, and he sings the song, and yet it has changed a bit. And so listen to the changes in the song as he sings it now. The road goes ever on and on, out from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone. Let others follow it who can. Let them a journey new begin. But I, at last, with weary feet, will turn towards the lighted end my evening rest and sleep to meet. And that seems to be the progression of life. That in our youth, we are so full of excitement and anticipation and just what is ahead. And then as we go through life, an adventure sets in and our reality of this is a broken planet full of broken people. And we become jaded and hurt as just loss after loss and hurt after hurt. And all these things start to weigh on us And so we still are looking forward, but what we're looking forward to is now not just kind of this mysterious hope of what is next, but instead is, I just want to rest. I just want respite. I want want to go to the end. You guys carry on in your adventure. He no longer has eager feet, but now I'm asleep. He he wants to just rest, to have a a surrender and a calm and a quiet in the midst of all of life. And so I I wonder today if you can resonate with that, that you still have this part of you that really wants to press on like this hope of what is next. And yet so much of life experience has shown like in your own strength and the strength of others and everything in between is just failure and hurt and calamity. And so where is this hope? Why is this hope so deeply instilled in me that I want it? In fact, that's probably the thing that unites us more than most things is we all have this deep yearning, this longing, this hole in our heart, if you will, that we take shovels and bulldozers and try to fill it in with so many things that if I can just get this, like I'm aiming for this, if I can get that, then man, I'll I'll be happy. Or if, if my relationship with this person could just be a little different, then oh, life would be so good. Or if I could get this position, if I could get that line cleared on my bank account, whatever it is, just the next thing, we feel this emptiness inside of us and we long for that to be filled. We want it so desperately to not feel so empty. We want that hole to be filled in. And so we come with this yearning to Easter because the Messiah, Jesus, the King, has died. The last week we covered how he's crucified on a cross. The sun goes dark. There's earthquakes. The veil in the temple split. It's torn in two. Like there's so much happening and yet the despair sets in. Can you imagine being the disciples that for three years you follow this man and you've seen him do miracles. He raised the dead. 
He has given sight to the blind. He is known as the friend of sinners. And we have been humbled enough to realize we are sinners. And he calls us friends. This was my friend. This was Yahweh come in flesh. He's constantly saying, I am this, I am that, always alluding to when God, Yahweh, revealed himself to Moses. And Moses is like, well, who do I say sent me? It's like, I am that I am. His perfect aseity. He's not contingent on anything. He's transcendent over it all, and yet the transcendent creator of all the cosmos stepped into his creation and called us friends. And we nailed him to a cross. He breathed his last, and he is dead. And so you come in, remember, the road, but now the road. I want so much more. So if you have your copy of scripture, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. So we have just two weeks left in our sermon series, Certainty, going through the gospel according to Luke. So we are in Luke chapter 24, and we'll start with the first verse. Luke chapter 24, Luke is writing, he says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. And so we need to establish context and recall where are we at in the story, in the narrative, where are we? Um, Last week we left off with the crucifixion. Jesus is dead, he has died He has been murdered on a cross, executed by professional Roman soldiers who knew how to kill people. He has been placed in a tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He's a wealthy man who has a tomb nearby in a garden. So he's placed in this tomb. The soldiers seal the tomb with a large stone that would roll functionally as a door. And then they seal it. They set a seal on it and they actually assign a guard of soldiers to watch it, to make sure no one can steal the body because we know these claims and all this stuff. And so here we pick up On the first day of the week, so Sunday, early in the morning, they came to the tomb. So who is they? We actually have to go back a few verses. If you go back into chapter 23, verse 54, it says, and this is the day that Jesus died, it says, it was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Preparation day is Friday, because Friday at sundown starts the Sabbath. From sundown Friday to sundown Saturday is the Sabbath, and according to Jewish law, you are to do no work. And so the day of preparation is Friday. You are preparing to stop. And so it's actually a lot of work to not work. Have any of you caught on to that with vacation? (laughs) And so the day of preparation, we know Jesus died on Friday. That's why we call it Good Friday. It was a Friday, the day of preparation. They're preparing for Sabbath when they can do no work. And so here they are. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And so these ladies watch. Jesus has died. They follow him to see where his body is placed. They know the tomb. They know exactly where he is. But sundown is coming. It is the day of preparation. So they go quickly to get these spices together, to anoint the body, to try to prevent the stench and decay and all that stuff, to arrest decay as long as possible. And so they know where his body is. They go prepare. But now it is Sabbath. And so they must rest. And so imagine silent Saturday as they're waiting in that despair. They've prepared the spices and they're gonna go and so now it is Sunday morning. It is now the third day. This is why it is the third day. This is inclusive reckoning. In the ancient language, they would count any day that any event happened on as a day. And so Friday is day one, Saturday is day two, and Sunday morning now is day three. On the third day, they come to the tomb. They're ready to anoint a dead body to wrap up those linen cloths full of spices so that it wouldn't stink so bad as our friend is decomposing in death. These ladies come. Look at verse two. It says, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. There's a missing body, and rightly so, Luke says, they were perplexed. Because here's the thing, like, the donuts, you walk in, you're like, oh, we have donuts today, this is an amazing day. Like, yes, the Lord is risen, but we have donuts. (laughs) You open the box of donuts, and it's empty. Sad. Sad. You walk outside. You walk outside, we're on public property here at a school. You walk outside to go to your car, Where did I park? I thought I parked right there. Click, click. Where's the alarm going off? My car is missing. Sad. (laughs) You 
pull out your phone, you open the inbox that always has the bills, it's empty, glad. <laughs> you walk along to a tomb, the grave of your friend, to mourn and prepare that body with spices, and it's empty, perplexed. A missing body, an empty tomb, is confusing. So these women are they're perplexed. Think, this is insane. Where, who would take a body? Why is the body? Why is the stone rolled away? Why is this an empty tomb that I've just come to? I watched them bring the Messiah here. I watched Jesus' dead body be placed in this tomb, and now it is empty. They are perplexed, and suddenly two men show up, and they're going to retell this story later in the chapter. And they actually explicitly now call them angels. Two angels show up, men in dazzling clothes. They show up. <laughs> now there's angels in their presence. They're confused. These dazzling clothed men are here. They're terrified, and so they just bow to the ground like, I don't know what to do in this moment. What's going on? And now look at verse, this is verse, uh, the second part of verse five. It says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Ask the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. These angels speak. Hey, this is kind of silly, ladies. I see your confusion, but what are you doing looking for the living among the dead? He is alive. Jesus is alive. He has risen. And listen, don't you remember? He said this would happen. He said it was necessary. He said this was going to happen. Don't you remember? Here is clarity. This is why. You don't need to be confused. The body's not just missing. The body's walking around. The body started to have a pulse again. Blood started flowing through the veins of Jesus. He started to breathe again. And he got up and he walked out. He is alive. Major publications around Easter time love to contest this idea. And so if you watch documentaries, you read the news, uh, you look at the History Channel, like all these different publications love to release things about the claims of the Christian faith around Easter. Like, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And so you get all these different things. Um, people know it's going to sell at this time because people are actually interested in these claims during this season. And so they release them intentionally around Easter. Uh, some, some headlines I'll read for you from recent years. Um, one, why America's record godlessness is good news for the nation. Or, Resurrection did not happen, says quarter of Christians. It goes on and on and on. The world loves to try to put Jesus back in the tomb, but he won't stay. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus has come out, and the angels stand there saying, what are you confused about? Why would you look for the living among the dead? He's alive. And don't you know that this was necessary? This was necessary. They repeat what Jesus had already told them. Back in Galilee, Jesus had said, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And so it begs the question, why? Why was all of that necessary? Why was it necessary that Jesus would be betrayed into the hands of sinful men as the sinless one? That the sinless one, the only truly innocent one, would be crucified. He would die a criminal's death, and then he would rise on the third day. Why was this necessary? And this is tied to everything Luke has been trying to do throughout this gospel. We began this series talking about, in his introduction, Luke is writing to most excellent Theophilus, and he tells him explicitly what his aim is. I'm writing to you so that you could have certainty regarding the things about which you've been taught. That you could have a certainty as to who is Jesus. Why is this actually good news? And so this is fulfillment. This is certainty for us. The necessary events taking place is all about fulfillment. And so three ways in which I hope that I can relay to you fulfillment for you and me today. As we record, or as we go through this recording of Jesus' resurrection, this is fulfillment of scripture. That you can go through the Old Testament as we call it and see prophecy after prophecy and not just explicit prophecy, but also beautiful beautiful typologies and just ways in which Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection are all pictured over and over and over throughout the scriptures. We are implicitly and explicitly told this is what will happen. This is how you can know who the Messiah is. And so this is necessary so that we would see this truly is the Messiah. 
This is the fulfillment of scripture. This is also the fulfillment of Jesus' own claims. As he's walking around, and they didn't, like, in live action recordings, say, like, okay, scripture, as he talks scripture. Like, most of these things are recorded in various ways, but they're, they're canonized. They're put into scripture later on. And so as Jesus is talking, this is the word of God giving the word of God. And yet, as he makes these claims, people would have to question, like, did he mean that? Is that really gonna happen? Because he makes all these claims, and this is fulfillment of his own claims. Because Jesus was continually going around saying, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came that the world could be saved through me. He came to offer everlasting life, to be reunited with God when sin had separated us. When we're living under the curse of our own sin, and the wrath of God is due on us, Jesus comes saying, I've come to make a way back to the Father. There is no other way. And yet, here I am as the way. He's coming gentle and lowly. He's meek. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He touches the sinners. He eats with the sinners. He does all these things that just blow our mind. How could a holy man come from God and do this? He says, because you, you have this paradigm where you think that your sin is contagious, contagious like your, your evil, your, your filth is contagious, like leprosy and all these other skin diseases. They're like, stay away, unclean, unclean. And yet now the clean one comes and touches the unclean and instead of him being contaminated, his holiness spreads as he makes others whole. <laughs> he forgives sins of sinners and says, sin no more. Repent, turn from your sin and follow me. He makes these claims, and now he dies, because it was necessary for the fulfillment of his own claims. I love, this is how um, Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, for since death came through a man, meaning Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, this is the resurrection. Afterward, at his coming, which we're still looking forward to, those who belong to Christ. And this is life offered for all mankind. But do you see the distinction there? As he fulfills what he claimed, there's a distinction. It's for those who belong to Christ. So do you belong to Christ? You must see that you were bought at a price. Jesus paid an infinite cost as the infinite son of God, the God-man, God in human flesh, come to earth. He died in our place. That was the cost of buying you. You were not your own. And yet now there's a distinction. Life everlasting is for those who belong to Christ. Because all of us in Adam were present and participants in sin. And so death has come to all through Adam. And now life can come to all through Christ. But it's for those who belong to Christ. And so you must respond. You must repent. Turn from your sin. And turn to your Savior. Trust him for salvation. See that he died. He rose again. This is necessary. This is the fulfillment of all of scripture. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' own claims. And lastly, this is the fulfillment of our hearts. Do you see that? Do you see the beauty of Easter? Where this all leads to, where the road goes, and we never could have dreamed of how much better than anything we could imagine was. This is so much greater. This week, I took my son to a skate park, and believe it or not, when I was like a young man, I was punk rock, you know, we're skaters and all this stuff. And so we go, and, and we're there, and we're up on top of, of the ramp, and and I'm looking at him, and he's, he's like kind of got that, like, oh, I'm a little terrified of this. I'm like, that's good. Keep a healthy fear. But that's the thing. Like, I've learned this the hard way after many, many crashes. You're all in or you're not going in. Okay? You don't do this halfway. Like, if you're going to drop in, you have to drop in. If you do this kind of like with some hesitancy, it's not going to go well for you. Both feet on that and go all the way in. And so he does it. Like, I can see the fear, but then he goes in, and I'm just watching, like, you know, his face lights up. And he's like, yeah, I did it. And then he wants to keep doing it and everything. And I watched something really profound happen, because we're at the skate park, and we've been here before. And usually when we show up, my son's a little guy, and he's putting around and everything, and the older guys, who are much better at all this stuff, um, they usually get really frustrated, and they'll say some unkind things, and I have to kind of get a little closer, like, hey, Dad's here. Like, watch your mouth. But they're usually really frustrated. They'll say things like, this isn't a playground. 
And like, they're, they're frustrated that this little guy is there taking up space on the skate park. But as I watch him drop in successfully the first time, and it's not pretty, but like he did it, but I watch how no longer are any of them frustrated. They don't view him as an annoyance anymore. Now he's part of the community. He's not great, but he's one of us. He's a little guy struggling with life. Go, bro. Oh, that's fascinating. You think of all the spheres that we walk in our lives. Like, what brings us into a community? And it's usually something that we do to merit our way in. They're like, yeah, I'm part of this now. Like, we somehow identify with each other. Like, I have a place, I belong here because of something I did. And yet, the gospel, the good news is that it's grace. You belong in the family of God, not because of anything that you did, but because of what Christ did. That Jesus was sinless, Jesus died in your place, and Jesus rose again and said, welcome to the family. We are here by grace. This is why the early church, it goes back to the early centuries, that the early church would, not just on Easter, but constantly be saying, he is risen. He is risen indeed. That there's this response that I say, he is risen, you say, he is risen indeed. And what is that all a reminder of? (laughs) I'm not in that. I'm not in that. The entirety of us being in this community is because of what he did. That he died, he rose again. And so that's where we find life. That's where we come into this family of God only because of him, what he has done. So you're welcomed in, you belong here. This is the fulfillment of our hearts. It is grace. That's why we see a cross and we see an empty tomb and we have to hold them in tandem. You know, I've I've actually not said this for years now as we planted three years ago, but our, our logo, the BC logo, it's kind of an Art Deco style, and the, there's kind of the explicit cross and the B. Like, it's not hard to see the, the B has a cross. But the reason for the duplicity and the C is that it's actually supposed to be an allusion to the tomb. That there's a stone rolling away. Because you cannot have a correct theology of our faith without seeing the cross is necessary. It is the fulfillment. The tomb, empty, is necessary. It is the fulfillment, and it is our hope. It is life for us. And so when you see the cross, you must see that you have been freed from things. But when you see the tomb, you see you're freed for some things. That you're freed from the penalty of sin and death. You're freed from the shame that he took on himself. You are free from so much. But that cannot be the end. To just say like, oh, okay, the wrath that was due on me is gone. Whew. Whew. Man. I escaped. <laughs> Barely. Thank you, Jesus. But no, it's to see, he didn't just free you from things, he freed you for things. That there's an empty tomb that God now is with us. He is alive and we will forever be alive with him to enjoy him today. You can enjoy him today. Your heart can be full today to see a resurrected king. And he sends his spirit to indwell us, to seal our hearts and then be in the midst of us, his people. The death could not even stop him. He has conquered it all. He shows up to John, one of his best friends on the Isle of Patmos later in John's life. And John's overwhelmed, but he says, hey, don't be afraid. I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and hell. Meaning no one's going into death unless I open that door. Jesus holds the keys of death. And he's already conquered it. That's how he has the keys. He's victorious over it. He freed you from sin and he freed you for life everlasting with him. To have your heart filled. This is how he said in John 6, 35. He said, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. To be fully satisfied. Who? How? What? That's not my lived experience. But it's in him. And so chase after all these other things. Like, ah, just around that corner, over that hill, and Jesus stands there with me. Like, no, 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 satisfaction is here. Right here. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 1611 says, you reveal the path of life to me. Not just me looking, uh, I wonder where that road leads. And so I look at you, Jesus. You reveal God. You reveal the path of life to me in your presence, in your presence, and his presence is here. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. Pleasure forever. And so 
Psalm 37, 4 says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Do you know what your heart desires all the time without fail? What it delights in. And sometimes that's a, that's a decision based on opportunity cost. That I'll take the less of two evils or whatever. But you always, your will is bound to your greatest treasure. You will always decide in accordance with what you value most, what you treasure most. <laughs> this is the promise. Take the light in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Do you want to know where delight is? Where joy forevermore is? It is in him. So delight in him, and then you will have your heart's desires. Delight in him to be reunited with God is what this is all about. So be reconciled, see and feel the beauty, the gravity of this, that Jesus dying and rising again is offering you life, hope that cannot fade. It cannot fail because it is a living hope. Because Jesus is alive, you will never have less than hope. And that is actually all you need. Hope will not fail us. We have an imperishable treasure stored for us in heaven. And yet he is here today with us as we walk through the calamity of this life and even come towards the end of it and say, I just want to sleep. I just want to rest. Take my feet to the end. Someone else can have their adventure. There's Jesus and come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. This is our hope. Bottom line, an empty tomb is confirmation. The sacrifice was sufficient. We are free and will forever be with God. You can know it. It is proof. The sacrifice was sufficient. He has paid for our sin. He has secured everlasting life for us. And that's life with him. He is the greatest. There is no one like him. And so as we conclude today, I want to finish up a few verses. And in light of this series, call you to some action because we're all going to face doubt. In fact, if you have no doubt, one, you are lying and I say that with humility but you you need to be honest with yourself because if you have no doubt, you have no faith. To have faith means that you don't know, you have not seen this. And so what do we do with our doubts? And Luke is writing Theophilus saying, I want you to have a certainty. I want you to do what Peter did here. These ladies encounter the angels, an empty tomb, and the angels are like, yeah, don't look for the living among the dead. Like, what? (laughs) This is wild. Now watch what happens in verse nine. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. What does Peter do here? He hears the words of these women, like the other disciples, and they're like, yeah, you guys have lost your minds. This is crazy talk. But Peter says, now I gotta see this. There's some doubt that Peter is experiencing. I don't, I don't know that I believe you guys. In fact, I just don't believe it. I don't understand what's going on. And so what does he do? This is what you must do in your doubt. Like Peter, in your doubt, run toward God with your questions. Run to an empty tomb. Run to the last place where you saw God. Run toward God with your doubts. He can handle it. He is not afraid of your questions. Don't just listen to some silly thing on social media. It's like, oh, that was a really good point. I've never thought of that. And just shut down. Like, ah, my whole faith, my life is falling apart. They just deconstructed everything I believe in. Like, no. You take that and you be honest with it and you run to God with it. He can handle it. He's not afraid of it. So like Peter, in your doubt, run toward God with your questions. And then like Peter, consider and explore the claims of your faith. What does Peter do? He runs towards where he saw God last. And then he stoops in to look into an empty tomb. He wants to see. They made a claim that this thing's empty. I want to see for myself. He starts to explore it and consider these claims. So explore it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Wrestle with your faith. Explore it. And Peter, I love it. It says that he stoops down to look into this. And this this idea of like, we, we too have to develop a muscle memory. You talk to people who are just masterful at any kind of like art, 
whether that's painting, like Heather made these beautiful paintings for Easter, or you watch someone who's just a great skilled craftsman and putting together fine furniture, just all these different things, and, and playing the guitar. Josh teaches guitar lessons, classical guitar, and you watch how his fingers move, and you're just like, that is amazing. And you talk to these people, and only so much of it is just the cognitive understanding of how to do that. So much of it is the muscle memory. If I, have to, I have to do this and repeat it, and slowly over time, my hand just knows how to move. You learn and develop that muscle memory, and we too need to do that. Kneel down like Peter. Stoop down, humble yourself before God. I say, I don't know the answer to all of my questions, but I'll submit to you. And ask them in humility. You look into the tomb. It's good for us to continually come back to an empty tomb and be reminded it's empty. And if it is empty, if the tomb is really empty, if Jesus has come back from the dead and he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, then should not all of my life change? This really changes everything. So develop the muscle memory of coming back to it, see the empty tomb. Again, like the early church saying, he is risen, he is risen indeed. It becomes this part of us, a liturgy for us, that we're constantly repeating these things, helping us to see the truth, to live in light of that. And then like Peter says, he went away amazed. He went away amazed. We too, like Peter, should be amazed. We should worship. We should praise God because he alone is deserving. We should see a cross and an empty tomb and that should conjure up so much adoration, so much amazement like Peter that we would walk away saying, wow, God, (laughs) there is no other possible way for you to show yourself as that glorious as to die for me in love and then to come back for me in love so that I could be with you forever in love. What a glorious, what a majestic God this is and this is how he has shown it to you. This is how he revealed his love for you, that he sent his only son to die on a cross, to come back from the dead, so we could live forever with God. So that we would always have hope, so that we would always know we are belongers. We know that we're known, and yet we're loved through and through. God knows me, he loves me, and now I can live in light of that. And I can do that with you. And we get into this beautiful community where we celebrate this, not just on Easter, but all year long. Every week we preach the gospel because you need to know and I need to know with this gospel amnesia, Paul Tripp calls it, we seem to forget and we live like it didn't happen. But Jesus did die. He did rise. And that is hope for us. That is freedom for us. This is forgiveness of sins. This is life everlasting. This is reason to be amazed. And so will you come today and let's spend some time just in amazement at this kind of a God. Sing your hearts out. Worship him. Love him. Treasure him. See the glory of God. As C.S. Lewis once wrote, he said, but the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. And you see that he is the fulfillment of all things. He is the end of all things. And he loves you. And he's calling you into life. So if you don't know him today, I pray that you would take a moment to consider these claims. He died for you in love. To be the sacrifice. The sacrifice was sufficient. Shown to be so in an empty tomb as Jesus conquered even death itself so that you can have life forever, so will you confess to be a sinner, that you have fallen short of God's mark. You have rebelled against the holy God, and you deserve death, but he's gracious, and he's our greatest treasure. So in grace, he has made a way to offer you forgiveness, to turn from your sin, confess him to be your Lord, trust him for salvation, believing in your heart he rose from the dead, Make that your confession and enjoy him for all of your days. Will you pray with me?
God, we thank you that there is an empty tomb so that we can have a full heart. God, we don't take that lightly. (laughs) And yet, with levity, we come rejoicing before your throne. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. At a great cost to yourself, Jesus, you would die and then you would rise again so that we could be with you forever. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. Like Peter, God, we are amazed that you would do this. This is our hope. So would you cement it in our hearts and our minds that we can look nowhere else? You reveal the path of life to us. Thank you. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.